Today we'll be going over Article 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution. This gets into more details on how a bill becomes law. Exciting! Let's begin. Complete text. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall return it, with his objections to that house in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal and proceed to reconsider it. If, after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that house shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections, to the other house, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and if approved by two-thirds of that house, it shall become a law. But in all such cases, the votes of both houses shall be determined by yeas and nays, and the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each house respectively. If any bill shall not be returned by the president within ten days, Sundays excepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law, in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress, by their adjournment, prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. Every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him, or being disapproved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives, according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of a bill. Clause 1. The first clause is trying to establish a separation of roles between the House and Senate, but it's also establishing a difference in intent. If you think about when it was written, the House was the only part of the Congress that would be voted by the people, because if we remember from earlier videos, the Senate didn't get their seats by people voting for them. In this way, the framers were saying, the way our government taxes its people comes from the people. Where this clause, also known as the Origination Clause, gets sticky are bills that definitely establish where revenue goes or where it might come from, but isn't a quote-unquote new source or isn't specifically raising revenue in ways not directly associated with taxes. There's been a lot of debate and the consensus today seems to be that only bills which create new statutes for specifically raising or creating taxes falls under the Origination Clause. But say a new program gets established in order to pay for it, certain taxes need to be changed or otherwise shifted in where they pay. Those don't fall under the Origination Clause because it's to pay for a particular program not to specifically levy taxes, and thus can be proposed and originated by the Senate. There's a lot more complication to that, though it's definitely nuanced. Clause 2 If you are old enough, you've seen the How a Bill, Bill Becomes a Law cartoon, and so you already know this part, but this clause, which is known as the Presentment Clause, is where the President gets their veto power. It talks about the path a bill goes to be created and passed in both the House and the Senate, and then gets presented to the President. This clause is where the President gets the power to veto the bill and send it back to either the House or the Senate, whoever originally created it, and then it has to go through another voting cycle where two-thirds of the chambers need to vote it in. If it does, then it doesn't matter what the President says and it becomes law. There's been some arguments and some desire by presidents, as well as certain congresses, to allow the president to do what's called a line item veto, which would be canceling or removing just specific items in a bill and signing the other portions into law. But this has been deemed by the Supreme Court to be essentially unconstitutional. The Congress argued that, hey, this was part of their ability for the Congress to convert their powers on another entity, as we learned early on. But since it went against the precedent and the fact that the Constitution had clearly indicated what aspect of law making the president would be involved with, it was deemed outside of the scope of the Constitution or Congress to confer that power. And besides, that, that would grant too much power to the president for lawmaking to unilaterally adjust bills as they came in. All this stuff about adjournment is a rare thing to see, 
But if a president is somehow considering a bill where within the next 10 days, the Congress chamber that created the bill would be adjourned, not just in recess for the day or the week, then the president can do a thing referred to as a pocket veto. They just don't sign the bill and it goes back to an adjourned group and that means it doesn't become law. If it's still something that the chamber wants as law, they'd have to resubmit it. Clause three. This clause is sort of saying all these things follow the same path talked about in the presentment clause. This clause usually gets combined with clause two, the presentment clause when people are talking just because they cover many of the same things. When separate, clause three is referred to as the ORV clause or the orders, resolutions, and votes clause. This additional verbiage was seen as necessary so that the Congress couldn't call one thing an order or resolution or another term to avoid the veto section of the presentment clause. And to further avoid that, there's been an agreement in Congress that this clause is basically saying, hey, if it's about lawmaking, it falls under these rules. If it's just run the business type stuff, it doesn't need to go through the president. The only additional piece is that amendments don't need to go in front of the president for consideration into law, which sounds a bit odd, but if you think about it, the original Bill of Rights wasn't either, since there wasn't a president yet, and that has been used as precedent here. All right, that's it for Article 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution. I hope the checks and balances are becoming clearer and clearer as we get deeper in, because that's the thing I'm noticing most. This section clearly continues that trend, and I'll be interested to see where else it pops in. Till next time. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.